Well, good morning and welcome to Real Life Church. I'm Pastor Bob, and I want to thank you for spending your Easter Sunday morning with us right here online. Now, whether you've been going to church for your whole life or this is your first time listening, I'm glad you're here. It's Easter, and we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the highlight of our belief in Christ. Now, before I get into our message this morning, do me a favor. Share this video with your friends. What a great way to get God's message of the resurrection into your friends' lives. You can do that right now by just simply sharing. Next thing, if you're wondering what's going on in Real Life Church, here's that QR code. Go ahead and use it right now, and that's going to take you to our What's Happening Here at Real Life and in our community. Today, I want us to think about some empty promises of Easter. Actually, we're going to look at three of them. And I know it's kind of hard to look at these promises because we live in a world where things are promised to us all the time. And we've become pretty cynical about promises. Companies, organizations, people, well, they just make offers that are too good to be true. We watch TV advertisements that say, if we'll just do this or do that, they promise you that you'll be more happy, more rich, more sexier, whatever it is, if you just use their product. And it really doesn't take us too long to realize that the world's promises usually come up pretty empty and they rarely deliver what they promise. But God is a completely different story. God has never made a promise that is too good to be true. Matter of fact, if you go back and you begin to count the promises that God makes to mankind, you're going to find over 7,000 of them from Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation. 7,000 promises. And they've all come true. Every single one of them. See, the world promises things that are empty and full of emptiness. These empty promises are full of promise. Let's look at the empty promise of the cross. Thursday evening, sometime Jesus is celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples in an upper room. Jesus, you know, leaves there and goes into the Garden of Gethsemane where he's arrested. And that night, he faces several trials. He's condemned. He's condemned to to be crucified. Pilate really didn't know what to do with Jesus, even though he may have thought he was innocent in order to keep his job and keep the peace. He delivers Jesus over to be crucified. And you can read about all of that in Mark chapter 15. Matter of fact, all of the Gospels talk about the crucifixion of Christ. They took him to a place called Golgotha. They divided up his garments and they crucified him. They put inscriptions over uh, the top of his cross saying the king of the Jews. He was crucified with robbers on his right and robber on his left. There is no doubt that Jesus was crucified. It's recorded not only in scriptures, but it is recorded in the history of the Jewish times. After the crucifixion, Jesus is taken by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus and prepared for a burial. But I want to kind of go with you for a second. What if you and I were there on that day of the crucifixion and we watched Jesus be crucified. And then we were to go back on Saturday to that same spot where Jesus was crucified. We would probably see the remnants, okay, of a crucifixion. We would probably see the relics of his death. Maybe you would have seen the braided crown of thorns there on the ground that Jesus wore. Maybe you would find some iron-clad nails that were full of blood and dirt. But what you would have seen there would have been an empty cross, all right, tinged with the blood of God. Now, that's kind of bizarre, isn't it? It's not man's blood that was there. It was the blood of God. To think for just a second that your sins and my sins were nailed to that cross. You see, that was the plan. That empty cross signifies that the penalty was paid for sin. Lies, jealousy, anger, betrayal, 
not just of the chief priests or the angry crowd that day or Judas Iscariot, but our sins, our lies, and our jealousy, your anger and my anger, our betrayal. Well, don't we all have quite the list of sins, by the way? Matter of fact, the Bible is pretty clear about that. In Colossians chapter 2, I just want to read this one verse to you. It says, you were, talking about you and me now, you were dead in your sins, and your sinful desires were not yet cut away. Then he, and we're talking about God here, then he gave you a share in the very life of Christ. For he forgave all your sins, blotted out the charges proved against you. The list of his commandments, which you have not obeyed. He took the list of sins and destroyed it. Listen to this. He destroyed it by nailing it to the cross. So when we look at the empty cross, that six hours of agony that Jesus experienced on the cross, when he said the words, it is finished, you know what he was actually saying? The deed is done, okay? It is paid in full. The empty cross means that the penalty for sin has been paid once and for all. The cross is not an empty promise. It's full, it's real, and it is priceless. The second empty promise of Easter is the empty tomb. Now, I said earlier that Joseph of Arimathea came and took the body of Jesus and actually placed it inside of his tomb. Now, in Matthew chapter 28, it says that the Marys ran to the tomb on that first Easter Sunday morning and suddenly an angel appeared before them and announced and said, hey, don't be afraid. I said, I know you're looking for Jesus who had been crucified, but he's not here. Because he has risen from the dead as he said he would. Come and see the place where his body was. That's what the scriptures record. And even though he repeatedly told his followers and the Marys there that on the third day that he would rise again, they didn't quite understand all of that yet. Even in our experience, people who die just don't come back to life. Resurrection was something that was completely foreign and just as much as it is foreign to us today. I know that there are some people out there that think that, you know, that the disciples stole the body, but how could that really be? First of all, they were nowhere to be found. And how could these fishermen overcome, if you want to call it, a group of highly trained Roman soldiers? Some say that the soldiers actually stole the body of Christ. Had the soldiers stole the body? Wouldn't have they displayed the body if they had it just to prove that this whole thing called the resurrection never happened? I mean, that's what they would have done. Maybe it was the religious leaders. Maybe this was a coup from the very beginning. The religious leaders stole a body, but the same thing goes, you know, when people started talking about the resurrection, because um, Jesus is going to start to appear to people. He's going to appear to individuals and sometimes small groups. And he even appears to a group of 500 at one time. And if they could dispel the rumors of Jesus um, by just saying, hey, we've got the body. It's right here. I mean, that would have squashed this whole Jesus movement for the very beginning. See, the empty tomb has stood the test of time. The promise of the empty tomb is a promise that Jesus was resurrected that he was risen from the dead. And this is what the empty promise is to us. Because of the empty tomb, you and I, as believers in Christ Jesus, will also be resurrected. This comes one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. It comes from John chapter 11, something that is very personal to me. Jesus said to her, I am the one who raises the dead and gives them life again. And anyone who believes in me, even though he dies like anyone else, shall live again. He is given eternal life for believing in me and shall never perish. And then he asked Martha, do you believe this? What a great promise. That empty tomb right there is the promise that one day you and I will also be resurrected into eternal life. It's what we as Christians, we long for. 
That's what we've been living for is to be resurrected from this place, the earthly limitations of 24 hours and seven days a week and all of those limitations that we have. We will be resurrected into eternal life something that's unshakable, something that meant that we're destined to live with Christ forever. The empty tomb is a powerful reminder that Christ rose from the dead, never to die again. And he promises us, you heard the verse, he promises us if we believe in him, then we too will live forever. John Newton, one of those hymn writers from a long time ago, wrote one of the most famous of all hymns, Amazing Grace. And one of the lines in there says, when we've been there 10,000 years, it will be just like we first begun. 10,000 years. How many years are you going to live? How many years am I going to live? And that's just the beginning of forever. Now, the last promise okay, that I want to talk to you about on this Easter Sunday, uh, full of empty promises, is the promise of the empty burial clothes. Now, that is a weird thing, right, for the writers of God's Word, the Holy Spirit, to include in the, the narrative of this Easter account that the burial clothes were empty. You remember Jesus is crucified on Friday, it says that he dies right around three o'clock in the afternoon. There is very little time between three o'clock in the afternoon to get him off the cross into Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, okay, before six o'clock when the Sabbath would begin. So the preparation of the body was intense and it was kind of a shortcut on that day. And so they did a hurry up job. And that's really what Mary and Martha, if you remember, the Marys were going to the tomb to redo was to properly get him ready for burial on that Easter Sunday morning when they found out that he wasn't there. As soon as Mary's get there, they, they go in and they see the empty tomb and, and their response is to go and get Peter and John. And, and, and Peter and John are two of his closest disciples and they have a foot race. And, and it says that John actually beats Peter to the tomb. He goes into the tomb and he notices the burial clothes. It says that he believed. And I believe that was the tipping point for John. When he saw the burial clothes lying there, literally lying precisely where the body of Christ was, like as if the body just disappeared and the clothes went whoop, and the face napkin kind of folded and put aside. And it's amazing that when John sees this, it says that he believed. I want you to think about this. John's coming from crucifixion for a horrible day Saturday, what we would call a tragedy because of what John has gone through to what I call today's triumph. John could have left God and he would have missed out, but he lingered around where God was and he got to experience the miracle on Sunday. Mary bursts through the door. John runs. He sees the empty clothes. He's lingering towards God. He runs and he experiences the miracle. And it says he believed. See, the empty cross shows us the forgiveness of sin, the empty tomb, the promise of the future resurrection, and the empty burial clothes is the promise that God is real and it's true and you can believe it. You see, the message of Easter is hope. We're all broken people. We can't fix ourselves, no matter how hard we try. And our only hope is to follow the one who gave us the promise of eternal life. Jesus did his part for Easter Sunday morning. He died on the cross, he was buried, and he resurrected. And, and just like I said, he paid the penalty for your sin and for my sin. Jesus has done his part. The question is, have you done yours? Have you asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin? Have you accepted his sacrifice on the cross? 
Are you asking him to come in and be a part of your life and for you to live your everyday life for him? See, that's what a Christian is. That's what a Christian does. And man, if you've got any questions about that, I want you to email me. I don't know where you're listening from. I know there are people in Yuma listening. I know there's people in Oklahoma listening. We even have some overseas listeners. The most important thing you can do is accept those empty promises of Easter Sunday morning for you personally. Let me pray for you. And then I want to invite you back um, next week. God, thanks for Easter Sunday morning. Thank you for the resurrection. Lord, he is alive. He is a risen Savior who has conquered death, burial, Father, for our behalf. Paid the penalty for sin on our behalf. Father, that we have a future with you that is not just today, not just tomorrow, but God, for the rest of all eternity. God, thank you so much. That's all that we can say. We can't say anything else but thank you. And we celebrate it. We say thank you. And God, again, we're so grateful. And God, if there is those out there that are listening today and they, they don't have that promise of the resurrection, it's not personal yet. I pray today is that day that they can ask Jesus to be their Savior, that they can ask Him, Father, to forgive them of their sins and to live their life for them. And God, if we can help them here at Real Life Church, then Lord, let us be the church that reaches out to them and connects with them and helps them in that journey. God, we love you, we praise you, and we look forward to what you're doing. And it is in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Next week, we're beginning a brand new teaching series called Snapshot. And what we're gonna look at over the next 10 weeks is different snapshots of Jesus' ministry some of his teachings, some of his miracles. And we're just gonna look inside of some of those things. And I promise you, whether you've been a Christian for 50 years or you've been a Christian for, well, maybe a couple minutes, who knows, right? God has something in store for you over the next 10 weeks, all right? I'm personally inviting you to be back here at Real Life Church next week. God bless you and happy Easter. Some tests last two weeks. This test lasted two decades. A study in the book of James. Join us for the sermon series, The Test.